We've talked a little already about ketoenol tautomerism and the fact that your average aldehyde or ketone has a secret double life as the enol tautomer, shown here for 2-methylpropanol. Under normal circumstances, the enol is present in very low abundance, less than 1%. This is because the combination of a carbon-oxygen double bond and a CH single bond on the left of the equilibrium is a more energetically favourable arrangement than carbon-carbon pi bond and OH sigma bond as on the right. But there are circumstances in which the enol becomes more abundant and occasions on which the enol form undergoes a reaction that the keto cannot. Using up the enol and pulling the keto-enol equilibrium to the right to generate more and more of the enol as reaction continues and eventually use up the keto form altogether. Or sometimes we might choose to make the deprotonated form of an enol which looks like this and is called an enolate. The enolate is in fact a resonance stabilized carbanion and it's formed from the corresponding ketone or aldehyde by treatment with strong base. So let's talk a bit more about enols and enolates, how we make them and what to do with them once we have made them. Well, in the presence of an acid catalyst, protonation on the oxygen of a ketone or aldehyde opens the way to deprotonation from carbon leading through to the enol. As noted already, this equilibrium lies very much to the left under normal circumstances, but it provides a route to the enol which can then react even if it's present only in low abundance. Alternatively, treating our carbonyl compound with a strong base, such as sodium ethoxide, the conjugate base of ethanol, can remove the hydrogen next door to the carbonyl group. We can draw the resulting deprotonated species as a carbanion, with a negative charge localized on carbon, or consider resonance stabilization, whereby those electrons are shared up onto the carbonyl oxygen to give an oxyanion form. So we have two different resonance canonicals for our enolate. Remember that the real structure is somewhere in between these two, and in this case it actually looks more like the structure on the right, because oxygen being more electronegative than carbon is better able to cope with the negative charge localizing on it. However, the carbanion structure on the left gives us a clue as to how the enolate is going to react. Now to form an enol or an enolate, there has to be at least one hydrogen on the carbon next door to the carbonyl group to start with. This carbon is usually referred to as the alpha carbon and the hydrogens on it as alpha hydrogens. This is because we use Greek letters to identify positions relative to the carbonyl carbon, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on. For the record, this nomenclature tradition is what makes beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin beta-lactams, because the nitrogen is attached to the beta carbon relative to the carbonyl group, and omega-3 fatty acids, omega-3, because the carbon furthest from the carbonyl group is given the Greek letter omega. In the context of enols and enolates, the requirement for alpha hydrogens means that there are some carbonyl compounds which can never form enols or enolates. Take a look at benzaldehyde here, or formaldehyde, acetophenone, and pivalaldehyde. In all these cases, there are nice healthy carbonyl groups, but no alpha hydrogens that might be removed, so we can't form an enol or enolate under any circumstances. Also note that it's not just ketones and aldehydes that can form enols or enolates. Other carbonyl compounds can do this too, including esters, as shown here. Deprotonation alpha to the carbonyl group, as previously, generates the carbanion form which we can consider being stabilized by resonance up onto that oxygen. However, carboxylic acids don't easily form enolates because they are deprotonated from oxygen first. 
giving rise to the familiar resonance-stabilised carboxylate anion. This makes removing a second hydrogen, alpha to the carbonyl group, extremely difficult indeed. A similar situation arises with amides that incorporate an NH because it's that hydrogen that's lost in preference to the CH on the other side. In compounds that contain two carbonyl groups on either side of the same CH or CH2, formation of the enol or the enolate is increasingly favoured. Consider deprotonation of this 1,3 dicarbonyl system. If we remove that hydrogen to generate the carbanion initially, we can envisage resonance stabilisation onto both oxygens. In green, the charge is spread onto the left-hand oxygen, and in orange, we're spreading the charge to the right. This greater spreading of charge imparts greater stability, so that carbanion, that enolate, is formed in greater abundance than would be the case for a single carbonyl group in isolation. We can get a handle on this effect by comparing the pKa's of these carbonyl compounds. Remember that the pKa gives us a quantitative measure of how easily deprotonated a species is. In other words, how stable the resulting carbanions might be. You can see that the dicarbonyl compound on the left is significantly more acidic or more easily deprotonated than the monocarbonyl species on the right. A similar effect is borne out for the corresponding esters, but it's interesting to note the difference between the esters and the ketones above. You see that the alpha protons in the esters are less acidic than in the corresponding ketones. This is because of that second oxygen attached to the carbonyl in an ester. As we've discussed previously in other contexts, non-bonding electrons on the second oxygen can get drawn into resonance with the carbonyl system. This is what makes ester carbonyls less reactive with nucleophiles than aldehydes and ketones are, and it also means there is less capacity for stabilization of an ester-derived enolate, so these pKa values are correspondingly higher. So how do enols and enolates react? Well, let's think about how a carbon-carbon double bond in an alkene reacts. It reacts with electrophiles, of course, like bromine here. Similarly, this pi bond in the reaction of phenol with electrophilic bromine that we've looked at previously. The pi electrons in both these examples are reacting with electrophiles. So enols and enolates do too. They react as nucleophiles with electrophiles via that carbon-carbon double bond in most situations. Let's take a closer look at this reaction of the enol with bromine. Electrons from the carbon-carbon double bond attack the electrophile in a familiar manner. And notice how electrons from the oxygen help to drive this reaction. In doing so, they reform the carbon-oxygen pi bond in the carbonyl system. And after deprotonation, we form this product. So overall, this gives us a neat way of introducing functionality at the carbon next door to a carbonyl group. A similar situation can occur with the enolate, which also reacts with an electrophile. In this example, we'll consider the alcohol halide, bromoethane. Using electrons from the oxygen to drive pi electrons from the carbon-carbon double bond, we can form a new carbon-carbon bond in this case, reacting again at the position alpha to our carbonyl group. This means we can brominate, alkylate, and do other interesting bond-forming reactions next door to a carbonyl. You might find it simplifies your thinking to consider the enolate as the carbanion C- as shown here. This makes it clear where it will react with most electrophiles, i.e. at that alpha carbon, giving rise to the new C-C bond. However, do remember that more of that negative charge will be localised on the oxygen, given its greater electronegativity. So it's better practice to show the enolate reacting as on the right here. Either way, the key take-home is that the enol and the enolate react as nucleophiles at that alpha carbon. Now remember that the carbonyl group itself is an electrophile at the carbonyl carbon. It reacts with nucleophiles like hydride, shown in here. So the carbonyl group in a ketone aldehyde or ester reacts as an electrophile. But the corresponding enol or enolate reacts as a nucleophile 
and it does so from the alpha position. This underpins a wealth of important chemistry, biochemistry and chemical biology, indeed many of the fundamental reactions that make life happen, and we'll talk more about these in class.